Pittsburgh, and it's our job to uh, to uh, lead the culture and keep people sane, balanced, and healthy. Remember why we're doing this work because we're tapped too, right? Just a little bit, says Melissa. Just a little bit. So um, I'm just going to remind us, how many of you had one board member change after the election? One. Okay. And, and of that, how many of you would say the dynamic on your board shifted because of one, maybe two, two people? Yeah. And, it, and so that's what we do for a living, is we watch and read as we facilitate democracy, right? So as we facilitate democracy, my question to you is, what aspects are you looking for in the dynamic of your board? So if you just turn to your neighbor, like these guys are, and talk a little bit about um, that question I just put before you. Yeah. What, what is it that, what's going on in your board dynamic that's helping you read things in your community? What's going on that you need to be in touch with as you adjust after this election? And if, you're, if your board hasn't changed, what are you still watching as they even morph or grow or shift? So just what's going on in your board dynamic that is helping you learn the context of leadership? Because it is context. All right, just turn around and talk to a few people. What's one yeah, thing that's happening? Your stories are awesome. Mother, mom. I got a big one. I give you that one. I didn't. I didn't end up using. Did those three boards come to me? Yeah, they're wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. 
All right, let me call us back together. Um, thank you, first of all. <laughs> um, I don't know where else you get to share like this. And if you really perceive this as a safe place, you're going to stop this time. <laughs> no, you're not. You get me going, I guess. Yeah, stop. it's a good question, right? It's a good. I mean, really, we could spend three hours on just this conversation. I just go four hours down here. Give me a break. Uh, hey, you need us. You yeah. need this conversation. We're going to give you more time. I'm all alone. I'm all alone. And that's actually not a bad phrase because I heard people saying what I've learned in my ears. I've heard people say, even though they're the same, there's this new energy. I've heard people say, and now she wants to be, and so it's just interesting as we watch the dynamics and the behaviors of people that are care deeply about their community and want to have a sway and an influence. And you know, you you toggle between leading and inspiring and directing and serving and being humble and doing what this group wants. And then, to what degree do you help merge their relationships when they have awkward? dynamics themselves. It's just, um, nobody does what we do. It's just amazing. Um, and I, I, I want to remind us that we, we celebrate the courage that it sometimes takes with this helmet of um, the bastion of courage. And we have someone in our room today that uh, had to have one of those difficult conflict of interest conversations. Have you ever had to have one of those yes. with a board member who's determined that they didn't have a conflict of interest, right? or the appearance of a conflict of interest, and then ultimately maybe had to recuse themselves on a vote. And then sadly, when there's a recusal of a vote, sometimes you end up with a 2-2. So what you wanted to move forward or thought you was the best advice with all your stakeholders to move something forward dies because it's a 2-2, right? Sometimes it's wrought with some grenade throwing or some name calling. And who, who knows what I'm talking about? Dish. Oh, admit it. Nobody's raising their hand, people, on the camera. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So there is this, this interesting tension. We have one of our colleagues who's dealing with it in a very colorful fashion in terms of this attributes of how do we balance that 2-2 feeling when someone has to back off. And I would like to award the Bastion of Courage Award to Dr. Jeff Smith from Balls. <laughs> Is that right? Okay, hold on. You gotta put it on. Yeah. The pink black is on. Bad enough to get it. Somebody get a picture, please. Somebody have a camera. Paul, do you have a okay? It's gonna work. It's gonna work. Okay. Okay, no. Don't let it slam your head. I really don't want to. You don't want to. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to share anything about your story or leave it alone? Leave it alone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <That's great. laughs> and, and it will open and close, so be careful. Oh, yeah. put those down. Bring it to Tucson. Yeah. Bring it to El Cajito. We're at your board right, meeting. There you go. All right, can we get a hand? So I want to talk a little bit about legislative season. Is anybody following the legislation pretty closely? A little bit. We had some wins. This, by the way, is 44 pages of the bills that we're looking at. There's about six per page, and it's 44 pages of what we're getting help with from Mark Barnes and Rebecca Beebe on. So Rebecca, come on up here. I just want to get you to share some stories with us. First of all, we had a couple of wins in terms of, well, you saw the four hour model, of course, but I think we even, are, we've got some flaws with the lowest bid model. Anybody following that one? And then the sanctions for a failing school, that seems to have died, increased sanctions for failing school. So we, we have a lot of people working behind the scenes and helping our legislators see some things. Um, but I want Rebecca to share with us what's going on. We just had a test, Betsy Hargrove from Avondale, she's not here with us today. She testified recently for a Sylvia Allen bill and helped and helped us really see local control as what we still want. We don't necessarily want the state micromanaging every attribute of how we turn around troubled schools. Um, so she shared her story. So congratulations to her. But Rebecca, come on up and talk a little bit about what are some of the ones we should be watching. And guys, since we have a range of people who do and don't follow this stuff and play or don't play in the field, um, let's keep some things basic, like what's the bill basically about, 
kind of who's sponsoring and who's behind it, um, where it is in the process. So some of us understand that it's a House bill or a Senate bill, or it's in education committee, or it's moving to appropriations, or it's in rules, kind of just where it is in the, in the process. And then what, if anything, we can do that might be swayable or, or supportive for our legislators. So okay. I'm going to kind of stay up here and help facilitate that. Question. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I have my document on my computer, so I'm going to be looking at my computer. Um, I just made a list of some bills I wanted to highlight with the group today. A lot of you participate in our <coughs> legislative committee, so you this might be um, a repeat of information you already know, but I'll start with the today on House Education, Senate Bill 1022 is being heard. It's also being heard Wednesday in a probes. Um, at two in the afternoon, that's the bill that Greg Wyman and a few of you have been working with Senator Allen on that reduces the seventh and eighth grade instructional hours to 890. Um, so if you want to sign in on that in committee, that'd be great. If you want to reach out to your House members, that would be great. That passed unanimously out of the Senate. Um, I talked to staff in the House. They think that everyone's okay with it. They explain um, you know, why the superintendents were pursuing it, why it was a good thing. Some legislators saw, you know, the lower, lowering of instructional hours and immediately thought that was something negative. Um, so I think we took care of that in the Senate, that discussion, but um, things always go differently than I expect them to. So reaching out to your legislators would be good on that one. And where is it in the, relative to the system? Well, I, so it's in, a, it's in education today and it's in appropriations Wednesday in the House. In the House side only. Right. It went through the Senate unanimously. Um, so another one I wanted to highlight, I wanted to highlight a couple last week um, that died actually in committee. Um, a vaccine a bill that uh, creates a medical exemption in statute died in committee on a 4-4 vote. Um, as you know, kids have to be vaccinated to go to school. There's already a personal belief exemption in law. So people that have a religious issue, a personal issue, can already get these exemptions. And Senator Barto and or Representative Barto now and Senator Boyer have run bills, Barto's past committee, that create a medical exemption um, that in statute, they're afraid they're going to lose the personal exemption. So that was um, the reason for that. Kate Brook McGee and the Democrats killed it in the Senate Education Committee, but it passed through the House Health Committee after a two and a half hour um, vaccine presentation from I'm trying to be careful with the words I use because I've gotten in trouble, but it was an anti-vaccination presentation that was given in, in um, House Health Committee for three hours. So I, the governor came out and said that he will not sign any of those bills. I'm sure you saw that in the news. So um, that's where the vaccine issue is at right now. Um, 1459, I sent out to the group that was a bill from Senator Allen that required school districts to send out a form and get that signed at the beginning of every year that included all the curriculum information for the year, including every single book, whether it was extra credit or required from a book report, um, and every single website that the students would visit. Obviously, that's not possible to do. You can't. Um, that's unenforceable and ridiculous. Uh, we talked to the sponsor and told her we were opposed to it. She said that was fine. She, her words were, I understand, I won't hate you. Um, a, a woman testified in committee, a mom, it was really weird. She was from the Scottsdale Unified School District and was not happy with the books. Not just the curriculum that her students or her children were reading, but the, what she called extra credit books that the teachers were assigning and the books they kept in the classroom. But that died. Um, Senator Pace brought a teacher from Mesa Unified School District who uh, testified against the bill. We talked to him beforehand, didn't know where he'd be on it. And he reached out to his district and the teacher came and testified against it. And he um, helped kill it in committee, which was really nice. So if you can, you can tell him thank you for that. Bills don't die in committee very often. We were assuming we'd have to kill it on the floor. So that was, um, that was kind of nice. So another bill that died in committee that same day was, I have trouble with bill numbers because there's so many. I believe it was 1348 related to a school facility um, school facility survey that required the SFB and ADOA to do a um, compile a report with any building that was um, under 50% occupancy according to the SFB minimum facility standards. It also had a what we were calling rent control provision in it that said a school district couldn't raise the rent um, by more than 2% a year. And uh, Dr. Kellis helped us with that, as well as we reached out to Larry from Phoenix Elementary. Uh, Mark testified against it in committee, and it died in committee. Kate Brooks and McGee talked a lot about her work with the SFB and the problems with the uh, minimum facility standards. 
and she voted with the Democrats and it died. Um, we saw it come back again in appropriations as a strike everything. That bill did pass a probes and it's going to the floor. It's not on the calendar for today, but that'll likely be tomorrow. Uh, she made some significant, the chamber is running this bill and she made some significant changes to the bill. We suggested one more amendment to it to uh, make it a little more palatable. So the bill now, instead of saying um, an underutilized space is less than 50% of SFD uh, calculation, it has a definition in there. Um, so a building, they want, it, they want them to find SFD to identify vacant buildings, which they define as a building that's been empty for two years, and partially used buildings, which is defined as a building with 4,500 square feet of contiguous unused space. Um, it also exempts special ed, CT, era. So just put your classrooms separate apart. <laughs> so if there's five we're classrooms we're together, we're, yeah. <laughs> so it exempts special ed, preschool programs, um, schools that have been open for less than five years in the, in the language. Um, we talked with Becky about an amendment to include a space that's used for CTE. And we also worked out an amendment that we shared with her in I think from the last email I saw Senator Leach, who's working on the bill with her, is okay with it. That it gets at the um, the rent increase. So it's our amendment says that a district can increase the rent with the charter if they can specify the reasons why the rent needs to be increased. So that can be student enrollment growth, um, you know, capital update projects, or or parking lot updates. Um, with Phoenix, they, you know, increased the rent because there was a law that was put in place last year that says that a district has to get the highest market value for their property. Um, so that language, we think we worked with ASBA and their attorney to draft that. And we, we told them if they, if they do that and they take out a provision in the bill, which they said they will, which requires you to put your vacant and um, underutilized space on your bond and override templates, then we'll be neutral on the bill. So we've been working a lot on that one and it's, not going to go away because we come back. So that's a major concern for our district because we've had a closed building that we've been leasing to a private school, but just a portion as well as pieces to the community. But we've targeted. That's how we sold our seat head election. Was in a, it won't happen next year. A lot of work has to be done. It's a mess. But to move um, EVIT courses in there as a seat head center, but that won't happen for another year. So if somebody would want to come in before that, do we have the ability to protect what the CTED's going to need? It's kind of a unique situation, but that's how our community passed it. Well, you're not looking to lease it, right? I mean, you're, no, you're just leasing it to even yeah. in a year. year. But we, we have to clean it up. It's been used for storage. It's a mess. We have squirrels. So, <laughs> no, a squirrel, a squirrel, you're not right. talking about the animals. So, <laughs> they're really, oh, squirrel, squirrel. a vacant, okay, all right. So, but I mean, Are you in the lease currently or you're planning on well, entering the lease? Well, I just passed it in November. We're working, okay. the lease hasn't been presented yet because we're in the process. Yeah, I mean, I don't think this would impact that. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I'm very interested in the CTED piece as you talked about. Well, the CTED piece came from Tucson Unified, and they said they have some space that may be considered, um, that may fall under that partially used category okay. that they're using for CTED um, purposes. Uh, I can email their lobbyist and ask more. I haven't seen, we, we gave them the language on the rent increase uh -huh. and asked for the bond. Um, language to be yeah. taken out. I haven't seen the CTED language, okay. but I will email him. I may write it down to email him and send that. Thank you. Who determines what's vacant? Yeah. Exactly. Right. Local charity. Yeah, that's the only So they're going to come in. But is that how do they do that? They just walk around and look see if there's I, there? They have a formula, a square foot formula, formula for time. population. That's a problem. When did they have it? 80, 80 so, 90 square foot thing. Yeah, so the bill says that now the underutilized school is a school with 4,500 square foot of contiguous unused space. So they're not going off the SFB formula for. Who's walking around? But the piece that you said that we have to declare on our bond pamphlet language. Say that again. So the bill requires that this information that's collected by SFB and ADOA 
that's new. That would go on the bottom and template. What did you guys say you gave up that you could control on? So we, that has to come out. Yeah. We won't go neutral if that's in there. Okay. So Question. my understanding is that is coming out. Good. Okay. okay. That's so. Good. Yeah. Thank you. For that. So if that's in there, we wouldn't be neutral. Good. Yeah. That would be a killer. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anything that goes on bottom of right templates, we're not like per people expenditure or that type of thing. Yeah, we can't have that. On. How yeah. This is a Senate Bill 1161. There's a strike everything on 1161. I, I thought I heard you say that. Yeah. I wanted to clarify. Yeah, no, the, if that comes out with the language related to the rent increase, then we're neutral. Is there something you think we should be doing, if anything, on this one, or just uh, let, it, let it live its life? Um, nothing right now until we see the amendment, which I hope to see today. Reverend, if you can uh, please uh, reach out to the Arizona Risk Liability Trust, my understanding, and I'm on the board, is that um, that the trust um, cannot insure two different entities within the same space. So if this, whoever you rent it to, crosses the space to where you're there not renting and something happens, who is responsible? Okay. So, okay. Did you have something? Nora. Okay. I was going to ask about um, what about initial cost? Is there if, they, if you can't raise the rent more than two percent a year if you get that out? Is there anything about initial cost? Any kind of formula if the chamber is pushing this? You can't overcharge on the front end. Uh, no, it doesn't address that. It says you have to get the highest market value. Highest market value. Yeah, with an issue with the issue with the okay. sale. Yes. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, Vacant space. So are they going to be looking at vacant space after hours or the weekend? I don't know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Archer. Yeah, uh, I'm just. Yeah. yeah. Um, but doesn't that come yeah. from the report that we have submitted to SFB on an annual basis about the use of our buildings and things that have that have come offline? I mean, we submit that data to SFB. Right, but not looking at the data. Your 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 schools are empty pretty much after three. So I just need it from four to eight so I can run school, night school. I don't think that that I would be. I just care about it. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't think that. Well, how, I, I mean, how many hours of the day do they have to be used to be considered? Yeah. 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 Okay, I am. So I'll I'll uh, keep you guys updated on what we see in terms of an amendment. But this is a um, really important issue to the Arizona Chamber. Um, what about okay. any other state agencies or subdivisions of government? Do any of them have vacant space or charges? <laughs> Good question. Probably. <laughs> what about the eighth floor? The empty offices on the eighth and ninth floor? There probably are. I think there's a lot on the city floor. <laughs> um, okay, so for, I'm going to move on. Sorry, just crunch for time. Um, 1457 is the school improvement turnaround bill. I we talked about it with the legislative committee. This is also coming from the Arizona Chamber of Commerce. Um, it has a provisions in there that trigger when the department can recommend to the state board to put a school on a turnaround plan if they're D or F for two of the last three years, et cetera. Um, we met with the chamber representatives, Becky and uh, Senator Allen's staff, and told them that the way the bill was written didn't, you know, didn't work. It's not that we're opposed to school turnaround. Uh, the way the bill's written, a lot of schools would be um, triggered by this. I think there were a lot of concerns about who and how the department and the state board would determine which schools need to be put on a turnaround plan. There was no funding attached to it. So the district had to choose a turnaround specialist and then incur the cost of that and incur the cost of anything that the turnaround specialist recommended. Um, so we were opposed to that. We talked to the Senator. She was very open to what we were suggesting. She said she had some issues with how they were identifying failing schools. She didn't think a DRF from two of the last three years was a long enough time span to uh, determine that a school was perpetually failing. And um, she also had some concerns how there was no, no funding appropriated to it. So the bill was given a um, informational hearing only. I was stuck in another committee, so I wasn't there, but you were there. Um, Betsy Hargrove was there and Mark was there. So I missed the discussion on that. I don't know if there's anything you it was, want to add. It was interesting because about 40 people, uh, oh no, excuse me. Uh, there was there was just sort of this quick little, It's it was just quickly brushed under the rug because I think frankly, Senator Allen 
heard enough from her staff that this doesn't have legs, this isn't going to work. She allowed, she voted yes, and everybody else voted no, or whatever it was. They didn't even vote. They didn't even vote. Yeah. So they, they just pushed it along and just let it die. Yeah. So they went really fast. So they want to have discussions on this over the interim. I think the governor's office is interested in a program or something like this. So it's something we have to um, participate in the conversations on that, obviously, and be open to um, some negotiation and discussion on that. Obviously, it has to come with um, some sort of funding, uh, but we'll see where that goes. Um, so 1256 is the procurement fix bill. Um, we've been working with EFRG and some of the contractors on that. That passed the Senate unanimously. It repeals the low bid provision and repeals the audit rotation provision. Um, that's going to the House. It's not scheduled for a committee yet, but we'll certainly need a lot more help there in the House than we needed in the Senate. Um, so this is a Senate bill. This is a Senate bill, yeah. And the ASPO folks and the vendor folks are on top of this pretty heavy handed, aren't they? Um, yeah, the contractors are yeah. working, EFRG, ASBO supportive. Um, we took the lead on the audit rotation repeal. Um, so there's there was an identical house bill that hit some hiccups and isn't moving. As far as I know, the, the intent in the beginning was to have identical bills put through both chambers with an emergency clause. The low bid requirement goes into effect this July. So it has an emergency clause. 1256 has an emergency clause in it because that needs to go into effect before the um, general effective date for a regular bill without an emergency clause. So when that gets to the House, it hasn't been assigned yet. I assume it'll get double assigned, which makes it a little harder for us to appropriations in education. So we'll be reaching out. We'll certainly um, need your help with that. So we've had some interesting, just talking to people on the audit rotation and repeal has been um, a lot of work and interesting what people's kind of miss perceptions about what a school audit is and what an auditor is, what a CPA is. That's so it's typically Heinfeld and Leach every three years is what they wanted to make you change, even if you built history with the person. Does everybody know which bill we're talking about? No. Sorry, I assumed we were all familiar yeah, with Yeah, no, one. we got to sometimes remember the okay. basics. So the bill from last year required that school districts rotate their auditing firm every three years. And so we're repealing that. So, and um, it's my understanding both of those are looking good, like they're going to they understand now what the problems are. They, the legislators, no? Well, it got out of the Senate unanimously, but when it gets to the House, that 2310 had some hiccups in the House. Okay. We weren't able to, um, we weren't able to really, that went to appropriations and Representative Cobb, who is the chair of appropriations, had a strike everything amendment to, that gets rid of all the language. So we'd have no low bid repeal. And then she wanted to institute a study committee on school procurement. Um, which is not what we want at all, obviously. We want the low bid repealed. We want the audit rotation repealed. So, so no, it's not quite a smooth sailing in the House. So when it's 1256, we're going to need some um, some help on that. I think all the conversation, I mean, I've walked into meetings with legislators who say things to me like, you know, auditing firms are in cahoots with school districts and there's all kinds, you know, and, and, and after a 30 minute conversation, you're able to, it's sometimes it's as simple as they forget that a CPA is licensed by the State Board of Accountancy and they're not out there. Um, their license is on, you know, so so we have productive conversations. There's just a lot of people to talk to. So we'll keep you updated on that. Um, a couple mandate bills I want to cover, one that we chose to be supportive of. Um, so if you weren't in the legislative committee, this is probably new to you. It's the suicide prevention training. This is in the six years I've worked with ASA, I've seen this bill every year. Um, so it, the, the bill that we're supportive of, that the committee chose to be supportive of, passed the Senate um, with two no votes. One was Eddie Farnsworth, so that's not a big surprise. Um, 1468 is the number on that one. It requires schools to provide suicide prevention training in grades 6 through 12 for school personnel that work with um, students. So the Legislative Committee had a lot of discussion about whether we wanted the language more specific or more broad. We decided that the broader it was, the more discretion is given to the district to determine who the personnel that work with students are. Um, the training is only required once every three years and the bill specifies that access has to develop and house the training online. Um, in the past, we've seen um, nonprofits and vendor groups uh, who have their own training that they want the bill written in a way that would require districts to use theirs. So part of the reason why we are okay with this bill and determined that we could be supportive is that it's clear that access um, develops and houses that training. They have a suicide prevention coordinator now um, who uh, can can do that for 
the agency. And we also worked to get an amendment to um, include a Good Samaritan clause in there. And I checked with that attorney that somebody in the legislative committee asked me to check with. I can't remember his name. If anybody who's there remembers, I think it was your suggestion. Who was that? Oh, yeah, it was a trust Trust. attorney. Um, And so he helped me with the language on that. So that got on. Eddie Farnsworth has a problem with it. He did the same thing last year on the school safety bill. He didn't like the Good Samaritan clause in the um, emergency stop orders for superintendents where they could initiate a order of protection with a family um, that had a gun. So Senator Bowie on the floor uh, committed to Senator Farnsworth that he would work on that liability language in the House. I was not thrilled to hear that. Um, And I made it known to the sponsor that we would be opposed if we lost that Good Samaritan clause in the bill. Um, So that's where that's at. Another mandate that we're opposed to is a vision screening mandate. Vitalist Health Foundation, formerly St. Luke's, is running this. They've um, been working on it with stakeholders, not including school districts. Uh, For a couple years, they um, hired Becky Hill to represent them. Um, So this is moving, basically is what that means. And uh, it went through committee. We uh, were opposed to it. I think Chris Cotterman ended up testifying against it. I I was stuck in health committee or in the house that day. So it requires schools to vision screen students um, three times during their educational career. And those three times will be determined by the Department of Health Services. They told us they want it. I think it's kindergarten, first and third grade. Um, And it requires DHS to develop the training for that. And there were some issues that a Lions Club member raised because he, his organization does a lot of volunteer work in districts. So my understanding is that an amendment will address the specific language around what type of screening is required so that um, whatever screening the Lions Club is doing will still count under this. We had a long stakeholder meeting with Vitalist and Becky and Senator Allen a couple of years ago. And a couple of years ago, feels like a couple of years ago. It was a couple of days ago. Um, it was like last Wednesday and said, we are still opposed. We listed off all the other um, mandates that are going through this session and said, you know, vision screening is important, obviously, but we, we gave our, our arguments that are, um, I think, very valid, but they get tired of hearing it's an unfunded mandate. Um, A lot of the conditions they talk about, the permanent conditions that kids have, they get when they're six or seven. So um, they need to be screened when they're younger, obviously. Why isn't the medical community doing this, et cetera? That bill is going to move. So we're trying to make it as um, workable as we can for districts. Um, It's on House Cow for today. I have not seen the amendment. I emailed staff and I asked for it. So we'll see. Um, 1468. Then, that's, that's oh, it with the suicide. suicide. Yes, that was the suicide training. I'm sorry, you're right. That is the suicide. 1456. 1456. Yeah, that's the vision screening. Then there's also a dyslexia screening bill, which I believe is 1318. So another mandate. Um, this requires DHS. It's, it's a mandate on DHS to mandate on the district. It requires DHS to um, hire a dyslexia screening person who then screens all kindergartners and first graders in a district for dyslexia. Um, it was about a three hour hearing on the bill. Kid after kid after kid after kid after kid, parent, parent, kid, kid who um, had an experience in the school not being, their dyslexia not being um, caught or whatever. Uh, so we're opposed. Um, I told Senator Boyer we're opposed. He said he's going to work to get funding in the budget. Um, We stayed a little bit quiet in committee, but when it moves forward, we're going to be um, very opposed. Yes. So would the funding include covering a doctor? I don't even have enough nurses. I mean, that is typically a medical diagnosis. So are we not going to? Well, I, and I told him. Yeah. I saw, I, he sent me an email saying he's going to be seeking funding. And I told his staff. Yeah. For doctors. He doesn't even want to vaccinate his kids. (laughs) <laughs> he, doesn't. he doesn't. He told the starting committee about that. Um, it's, yeah, it's not a secret. He's public about that. Um, well, I mean, the vision screening bill has funding. That's $100,000 to DHS. That's not really going to do anything for districts. So, yeah, the funding the funding will not bring ASA or ASBA to neutral. Um, and, and we're very opposed. And I talked with some people from the special ed community, and they have some issues with 
um, they know more about dyslexia than I do. Um, the bill talks about people being at risk and they can speak to how you're not really at risk for you know developing dyslexia if you have it or you don't have it. And, um, so I, I, again, it's not something I know a lot about, so I'm not trying to be callous. I'm just, um, so we'll be um, more openly opposing that. What I mean. um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think, I mean, they need, if we're going to get into the medical stuff, they need to be funding the medical stuff. Yeah. And this is what it is, heavy pens or vision or whatever yeah. that's going to be. They keep forcing the medical <coughs> onto our school system. And that's back to unfunded mandate. And then the other is the whole spend funding revision thing. I mean, what happened to that? The we're going to get funding for special ed. And you, they won't fund special ed, but they'll add more stuff to the service. Yeah, so the special ed uh, uh, weight discussion is just a discussion for this session. I have that on my list. 2670 was the strike everything amendment in the House that um, established a spe establishes a special ed study committee consisting of five House members, three Republican, two Democrat, um, to study the special ed weights. We signed in support of that. We knew from staff and the um, we were told that the special ed bills and the weight fix would not be moving this session. There's just too much other funding things going on, um, especially with the opportunity weight moving. So that will be a discussion over the interim and hopefully just to answer your question. I know it was, you weren't really, not the answer you're looking for, but that is. Um, no, I'm just saying to be yeah. consistent in our lobbying, they're not, they're studying, you know, they're studying special ed and they're not funding that, but then you want to turn around and add services yeah. somewhere else in the system. Yeah, no, it's and I mean it, it it it's the same thing with the suicide prevention bill too, right? I mean if you're not going to fund um, social emotional wellness, you know, school counselors, whatever, um, on campuses, why are we still mandating um, this training? So it's kind of a common theme. Um, sorry, I'm skipping around here a little bit. 1071 is a uh, Representative Boyer's teacher evaluation bill that um, removes the state board. We support this bill. It removes the um, the requirement that the state board adopt the framework for the teacher evaluations and moves that to the district level. So now districts are required to adopt teacher and principal evaluations. The only statutory requirements are that they include four performance classification levels. There's other statutes that reference that and um, that they include quantitative data. And that quantitative data is between 20 to 35 percent. So it's currently at 33 to 50 percent. And Representative Boyer, now Senator Boyer, has been interested for several years in lowering that data. Um, we're supportive. The school board association is supportive. Uh, AEA was opposed. I think they might be neutral now. Um, we're really trying to help Senator Boyer out. He's very, very interested in passing a bill on teacher evaluation reform. Those of you on the legislative committee know that this is like major, major deja vu. I can't even remember all the provisions of his old bill. And there's been several, there's been strike everything. Senator Smith was involved at one point. It was really weird. Um, that got to the governor's office and got vetoed. So this is uh, the best um, that we've seen. It doesn't address what we had issues with in the past, which was the prohibition on uh, quantitative data on the group B teachers. Um, this is not included in that. And so how broad or narrow is the data definition? It just says quantitative data. So it just says what, but it just says what statute says now. At one point, it was very specific on AZ merit data. And I pointed that out to staff and um, Senator Boyer, and that was amended to be fixed because um, that's obviously more strict than the current statutory definition. Uh, so, yeah. So um, if somebody asks you about that bill, ASA is supportive of it. I, I think that AEA is neutral now. Um, they are very interested in the Group B issue, which um, the chamber and the governor's office and us all had opposition to in the past, and we still do now. I can't speak for the others. Uh, I'll move on to the school safety. Representative Hernandez, um, for background, he was a Democrat, and he was Gabby Gifford's staffer during the shooting in Tucson, so he was there. Um, he is running a bill with March for Our Lives, you know, the teenagers, um, on school safety, and it is 
gone through committee and it is just in limbo in the house somewhere. I'm attending a stakeholder meeting tomorrow with him and Senator Brookenegi on the bill. The bill has a lot of issues. You have to, um, schools have to adopt a safe school plan that includes all kinds of interventions for all kinds of issues. Um, obviously without funding and staff, it doesn't work, but we were not gonna go openly oppose a March for Our Lives and Representative Fernandez bill in committee. That would be really bad optics. Um, and the March for Our Lives kids are really impressive. Um, I don't know if you guys saw them testify there. They are very um, articulate and smart students, but Senator Brooke and McGee has a strike everything bill and that number is 1044. And um, it requires the Department of Education to develop a safe schools plan that it can then recommend to districts, but there's no <coughs> um, mandate on districts adopting or implementing that safe school plan. But the provisions of the, um, the safe school plan that the department would have to require would be uh, you know, explore the use of online um, resources for kids with um, uh, crisis response, online resources for kids that have been identified as being at risk for different issues, protocols for communicating with parents, protocols for adopting staff training and recognizing and referring um, you know, at risk kids. So it um, is a lot better than Representative Hernandez's bill because it's not a mandate on the district. So we didn't sign in support of it. Um, but when I attend the stakeholder meeting tomorrow, obviously, I will say that we prefer something. Yeah, Paul. What's the number on that? Originally, also said you want to say 1044 is a striker. 1044 is the striker. Um, 1071? No. No, Hernandez's striker. bill is 2547. So when you're at the meeting, um, we had some remarks for our lives. Kids come to our board meeting. Just one thing is that they're great kids, they're very articulate, they make their points. but. They were, I think, confusing the governor proposal for social workers and counselors in the- 2597. 2597, thanks. Um, they were confusing, I think, the governor's proposal of social workers and counselors and schools with their bill. Right? When we read the language, it didn't say it. Because as you said, it doesn't have any funding, but it doesn't yeah. have any specific language to proactive, say, social worker counselors. I mean, yeah. So it seemed, I didn't want to call the kids out. Right, the yeah. Of, you know, you're, again, like you kind of said, it's one of those moments where you're like, yeah. hey, public speaking skills, kind of thing. But, but the idea was they were, I think they're confusing the governor's yeah. discussion on what he wanted his budget to this bill. So yeah, and there was a lot of discussion in committee. They talked about, um, you know, school districts being on board, getting them to adopt. The kids talked a lot about um, the school boards that had adopted something, I don't know if your school board, or something that they've proclamation or something that March for Our Lives had. Um, but I think it yeah, I think it's clear to, you know, the sponsor and others that that doesn't mean the school, you know, the school districts are on board and I think everybody recognizes it's a bunch of kids. Um, and I don't mean that condescendingly, but, you know, same thing. Um, so we've got that meeting tomorrow and I, I don't know where the governor's school safety bill is coming into play. I've reached out to a couple people to see if I can get some more info on when and if that will, um, when and if that will be introduced. Yeah, so their bill um, requires a school district to uh, adopt a safe school plan that requires like initial screenings for kids for at risk behaviors, um, adopting. So we all have safety plans already. Right. They want us to screen the students on. Yeah, I mean, the safety plan would include things like. Uh, teacher training on not just suicide prevention awareness and recognition, but other at at risk um, behaviors. Of, I think that they. I, I don't know a lot about Mark for our lives. I I don't know if it's like. Uh, I mean, they're pretty organized for being a student group, so I don't know if it's um, like model language they've gotten from another state. That would be my guess. Representative Hernandez, Mayor Helpson, and staff. We see a kid, and the kid in the screening comes up looking at this thing. Do we have to screen them further? Do we have to do a threat assessment? It doesn't say anything about threat assessments. Um, it, it said, it, I mean, it's pretty broad language about screening and finding an appropriate referral for the student. Yeah. Has anyone looked at the screening that they have for the Everything you mentioned pretty much seems to already be covered. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's always been a part of the conversation, especially last year when we had the big um, school safety bill moving, and that will definitely be part of the, you know, part of the discussion tomorrow in the meeting. Rebecca, on school safety, House Bill 2693, that's the one on loaded guns on all campuses. Yes. They're voting on that right now. Do you have any sense of... Um, right, like, at this minute? Yeah, but, well, that's one, one of my contacts just said. So. Okay. Do you have any idea what's happening? Um, yeah, that bill passed committee. Uh, they're they're going to the floor. Maybe they are on the floor right now. Uh, yeah, so I think that that bill's not going to pass the floor vote. It certainly won't. Um, I mean, knock on wood, pass the floor vote in the Senate. It's obviously a huge problem. Michigan actually allows loaded weapons on campus. Um, and so I talked a little bit with their state lobbyist about what that looks like and it's basically you go into lockdown or you have a police officer there every time there's a parent who comes to campus with a loaded weapon. I mean, it's an issue. We would do that anyway. Board members were coming with uh, loaded handguns yeah. to their board meetings. That's what started it. Then they started going into schools. We'll have to find. Yeah, so, so yeah, we'll I... Go what was that? We went into lockdown every time they showed up. Yeah, that's we created a, a cluster. That's what the, um, the school administrator lobbyist is coming with. Do you think they say we should have to do this? Like all nine of them should carry guns there. All nine of them should have it. All, they should all get aggro screening for sure. Yeah. What about the stop? What about the bill that should take part of the stop component of the pay for it out of the whole fund? The stop component? The stop orders? Yeah, the stop orders. Yeah, so I assume that we're going to see something. I mean, Governor Ducey has said he's interested in pursuing legislation again with the stop order. That's where a superintendent or principal, depending on how the language is written, can initiate that emergency order of protection um, um, with the student where the weapon and the family's home would be um, taken. We were supportive of that with the Good Samaritan Clause. Um, haven't, haven't seen it moving yet, but expect that it will. Yeah. So I know Rebecca, you wanted to scoot at 1129. We're just after that. Are you, is there any one last thing you want to make sure we hear? Uh, well, I have one more bill on my list, but I can skip it. I just want to make sure you're okay. Yeah, that's my last bill on my list. All right, let's go. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Um, so 1101, the schools calculated the opportunity index bill uh, moved through Senate appropriations with an amendment that brings that calculation. So this is the bill that creates an opportunity index. EFRG is working on it. Um, if, if I'm saying anything wrong, go ahead. Any EFRG member, stop me. Um, that creates the opportunity index where the school calculates the statewide average for participation in the free and reduced price lunch program and then compares the district average to that and creates a weight permit. It's at the school site level now um, with the appropriations amendment. And the appropriations amendment also included some language about schools that receive money under this weight um, have to submit a report on their <coughs> academic growth based on an assessment. So it also requires... <laughs> So it also, I, I, I need to reach out to Megan today. Someone from EFRG wants to address that more. The chamber had issues with the bill not having a growth component in it. So I won't say that I know where that amendment came from. And let, if you want to add. Well, sure. So the, she was getting heat from the chamber. Yeah. So it's very generic. Yeah. Extremely generic. Uh, she actually asked me how to write it. So I made it as generic as humanly possible. But the idea was whatever you use for growth, valid or not valid, put on the notes. The idea was that the idea is that whatever you're using for growth in your regular model was what you could use it. The concept is based on standards. So yeah. whatever you're using it, whether you have your interims or school city or you know the NWA, whatever you're using, you use. And that was the big call. Uh, the other part I didn't think you're here to say was that uh, you're trying to get an out two for one. So if you're for the district for, or for every dollar you got an opportunity weight, if you went down a dollar in your fee set. Um, now you can get for every dollar you get, or for every two, two bucks, yeah, you can put one. So that that, <coughs> that has less impact than these districts, obviously, for African sons, where they said this is. Um, yeah, so the Senate approves amend amendment, uh, I can't even talk, address the uh, growth, it put the growth language in, which I figured was came from, um, Megan. yeah, Megan. Um, 
to address what the chamber had been criticizing the bill for. It's the first time we're having a conversation about instead of just one getting from the general fund something for poverty. That's the general And the amendment moved it to the school site, but it hasn't addressed the the two for one D seg yet. By the way, the school site level is so if you're in Deer Valley above the one on one, you might not have a lot of poverty, but below the one on one, you might. So at the school by school, and then by the way, whatever dollars you get, that's up to the district and how to how to use. That was another clause that was written, so you have to you decide where you want to spend it. So that um, bill will go to the floor to. So what's the what case? You hear quantitative data again? What's the what? I didn't hear the question. Whatever you use, right, what? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty bad. That's pretty bad. Your own growth. Your own growth. Yeah. You just have to adopt the language that you have to adopt that, whatever that measure is at the beginning of the year. So we do what we do with the teachers, then we do with this. We do with. You could. You could. Yeah. Like, it's about field cards. Um. So ASA is supportive of that bill. Uh, you didn't mention Charter Transparency Act, broken McGee's work was on that. Uh, so Broken McGee introduced the Charter Transparency Bill. Uh, we did not take a position on it. Mark Barnes got up for Mark, was stuck in Education Committee when all these bills went up. And I was over in, in House Committee listening to the anti-vaccine um, presentation, uh, which I might get in trouble for calling it anti-vaccine presentation. Don't tell anyone I said that. I know I'm being live streamed, um, but that's what it was. And Mark testified about the issues with the, um, you know, he said it was a good bill, but the spending, the, the, the classroom dollars report in the charter version had different categories than what the uh, district AG. auditor general report uses, and that we would have some issues with that. It's a tricky position for us to be in because we're advocating against a charter, um, you know, spending report. So we're... Um, trying to be careful on how we phrase it, but Mark has reached out to Senator Brophy McGee and asked her to use um, fund codes from the Charter USFR or make something more similar to the um, categories that the districts use from the... The conversation went two ways. It went oh, yeah, de right deregulate the, the schools and increase regulation to charters, and it's not good enough. It's not what we want, ideally. I just think it's the beginning of the three-legged stool. Well, I, I want to then Mark to try and everybody, everybody saw your report just came out, and it does even make mention, at least in the newspaper today, that charters are not a part of this. Um, I, I don't I don't think it's wise for ASA to take a position, let's go ahead and just deregulate this whole system because that's where the accountability issue comes in right now. So we've been, there's a lot of discussion, I'll just say, about um, getting rid of the dollars in the classroom report for districts. Any response to that? Getting you want to get rid of it? Getting rid of it. Getting rid of it. Getting rid of it. The dollars in the classroom report for district. This was probably one employee years of looking at performing a small credit, the performance of the assessment for 20. So we're almost done. We're almost done with the 20 years. That's not repealing. That's not repealing. That's law. So that's our beef with charity. That's what I did originally and said, sure, let's do it. The key is if you take away this from us, and you're never going to have a chance for you to be put next to a charter system. And for those of you that are, I mean, they're always doing a pretty job trying to make it fair. Because I hear, I hear, I hear from superintendents. I hear two different. I hear, don't get rid of it, and I hear it's not valuable and it's used against us. Those are the like districts that don't have much charters. Both are true. Yeah, both are true. Yeah, right. Both are true. They're supposed to be. You know, we're supposed to be doing the school level reporting, and the school level reporting is supposed to be the same in both. Public so and then there's and then the auditor general is working with their committees on how do you apportion district spending and school level report. So what Mark said in his testimony, we want to keep pushing for on the tweak because the way they ended was, well, this is real close and it needs some tweaking and. We, I think, because they I had think 30 to 40 charter champions we here saying, yes, we system. like this bill. And they said, are you surprised that we're against this? I said, frankly, yes. And they said, no, we want to be held accountable. Why? why do Until we they have, have the management company do it. I don't, right. Instead of politically, I think instead of us picking a report that's out there, the, the position we want to advocate for is an aligned reporting system. So if I'm that's reporting all. administrative dollars, they're reporting administrative dollars. What's classroom to me? 
is classroom to them. They don't, yeah. I don't care. You know, I don't care if we have a legacy. We don't want to seem like we're so, whining Roger, by saying don't. So, Kathy, my finance person looked at their gap and that kind of stuff. And actually, Roger, the main ones of dollars, you know, classroom instruction, support, and admin are almost identical. You just need to follow the, the same system and then report it that way. That's, he's exactly right. That's, so, some of you have another category, like Trey Hart's wrote another. I have no idea what that other category is. So that That's one's the done. other 10%. Share, they did a share. Well, of course, we know what the point is under admin, classroom instruction, and support. It actually almost like that. So you should be able to put two systems at least in those categories right next to each other. Yeah, they had a shared services category where they put what, be, what, what would be district employees. They put those people's salaries and benefits in the shared services category rather than in their admin category. <laughs> you got to start somewhere. Can we give Rebecca a big hand, please? This is my season. If you want to stay involved, just let us know and we'll channel you somehow. And if you don't know talking points, we'll teach you talking points. So thank you and tell Mark thank you also. Um, who's got spring break this month? Sometime? Who's actually going to take advantage of it? Good, good. Who's being selfish and like going to take care of yourself like Jerry said, head, heart, hand, health? Do it, do it. And Mark. Do any of you give two-year contracts to assistant superintendents or, or anybody other than the superintendents but we can't because we have a we have a legal issue going on with one of our districts so our principal principal all right. See you June what for Tucson? June 9th, Sunday, June 9th, the conference starts. The division meetings are Tuesday, June 11th. Who's got who's doing a golf tournament? We didn't have a lecture. When do the ballots go out for the for the officers? Pardon? When do the ballots go out for the officers? Margo, when do the ballots go out? March 15th. During spring break. <laughs> but you'll all be reading. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. When does it end? When do close? Oh, one month. Okay. Right, right before taxes are due. Okay. Everybody drive safely back. Thank you for those who drove far. Have a good uh, Lupita, Nora, Donna, camera. Thank you.